Hey, Robert. How about now? Sure. Sounds good. I will uh, brush up on that and I might get in touch with them after the webinar here. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Bye.
There we go. There's audio. And video. Recording before we till we start. Mm. Hey, it is noon. I believe we are ready to get started. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan Siegel. I'm here with my colleague, Sean Maurer. And today we're going to be talking about uh, plan review and site inspection for the 2018 International Energy Conservation Code uh, pertaining to residential buildings. I uh, do want to note that today's session is being recorded and the recording will be available uh, following today's uh, session. So uh, you can find that at our website, cdac.org. Uh, as far as uh, for those who uh, need continuing education credits, uh, all attendees today will receive a certificate of participation. Uh, in particular, if you need uh, CEUs for uh, ICC or AIA members, uh, please go ahead and send us an email uh, when we provide your certificate. Uh, you can go ahead and reply back to that uh, and provide us your ICC or AIA member number, uh, and we will go ahead and report those uh, credits for you. Uh, but again, regardless of that, everyone in today's session will receive a certificate of participation. Uh, as far as our, our learning objectives, as noted, we're going to be talking about plan review uh, and site inspection, and as part of that, uh, dealing with compliance documentation. Uh, this does bring up a, an opportunity. Uh, we are developing some uh, compliance documentation checklists, uh, and we'll be uh, looking to release those here before too long. Uh, we are looking for people to uh, beta test those, uh, so if you are interested in being a beta tester for those uh, compliance documentation checklists, please go ahead and send us an email, energycode at cdac.org, uh, and we'll show that web address, uh, or that email address again at the end of the presentation. Uh, but a little bit as far as who we are, uh, as noted, we are the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center. We're housed at the University of Illinois, and part of our uh, primary mission is to reduce the energy footprint of Illinois and beyond. Uh, and energy code uh, training and assistance is one way uh, that we provide that uh, mission. I will note that today's session is being sponsored in part by the Illinois State Energy Office, housed at the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and we are uh, the code training provider for uh, the Illinois State Energy Office. So we do want to thank them for uh, providing uh, assistance with today's program. Part of the training program also includes uh, technical support. So if you do end up with questions uh, regarding the Illinois Energy Conservation Code, uh, go ahead and feel free to reach out to us, energycode at cdac.org uh, with that question. Uh, we'll note that when uh, 
when asking a question, we do ask that you let us know uh, if this is pertaining to a residential building or a commercial building, uh, as the energy code is split into two parts, and we want to make sure that we are referring to the, the right section uh, and lead you to a, a correct answer uh, quickly. So uh, we do have many online resources at our website, which includes uh, previous archives of workshops and webinars, as well as several online on-demand training modules. Uh, these are designed for uh, people who are less experienced at the energy code. So these could even be uh, potentially homeowners that could uh, take advantage of some of these and building occupants. Uh, so it doesn't require a high level of uh, code training uh, to be successful and, and learn uh, using the training modules. Uh, they take approximately an hour to an hour and a half to complete each one. So, uh, Again, we have several resources at our online uh, website. So, uh, As far as uh, access to uh, the 2018 IECC, Illinois Amendments, and Chicago Energy Conservation Code, uh, these links are also uh, available through our website. So again, if you uh, go to our Energy Code website, uh, cdac.org, uh, you can provide links uh, over to those. So rather than trying to have to remember uh, the, the long web address, uh, you can come to our website and, and we can help link you up with those resources. Uh, we do like to, to note that uh, the International Code Council does make all of their codes available uh, at no cost for viewing online, uh, and it actually has a very robust search function. So those are, are very uh, helpful to be uh, usable. So today's session is part of a series of webinars. Uh, our next one will be covering a uh, commercial envelope uh, in just a couple of months here on October 28th. So uh, this is, uh, if you do appreciate today's session and, and uh, have interest in additional, uh, particularly commercial uh, and uh, some lessons learned, uh, go ahead and, and register for those as well. So uh, first thing that we, we need to make sure that we cover is for the state of Illinois, when does the energy code apply? Uh, and for the state of Illinois, uh, typically this is triggered by if a building permit uh, is required. Uh, the International Residential Code and the International Building Code uh, provides uh, a listing as far as things that are exempt from uh, permit requirements. Uh, and so uh, several of these would not require uh, compliance with the Illinois Energy Code. Uh, but if your jurisdiction does require a, a, a building permit for something, then uh, the Illinois Energy Conservation Code is applicable. So, uh, another thing, seeing that as we are talking about residential buildings today, is first we need to know if we are in a residential building or commercial building, uh, because the uh, definition for the Energy Code is slightly different than in uh, several of the other codes. There is also an Illinois amendment uh, on this. And so uh, here in the state of Illinois, a residential building is defined as a one or two family dwelling uh, or any building uh, that's three stories or less above grade. In Ch the city of Chicago, you do get an extra story of four or less uh, that contains multiple dwelling units. Uh, and the, the key here being that occupants should be residing on a primarily permanent basis. Uh, and they do give several examples. Uh, so things like motels and hotels, because residents are not on a primarily permanent basis, would be commercial and not residential. Uh, so you may have uh, a commercial building and residential occupancies inside a commercial building and vice versa. So just being, being aware of that. So uh, today we're, we're talking about things that are residential buildings. Uh, so what we're going to be covering here uh, first is construction documents, and then second is inspections. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sean Maurer uh, to talk about our construction documents. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so first thing you want to get into is um, the 
uh, administrative section of the uh, Energy Conservation Code lists the required documentation um, for uh, plan drawings uh, that need to be submitted for code compliance. Um, so that code sections are 103.2. Um, you can see here listed, you need to have your facility R values, fenestration U values. Uh, if you're using an area weighted um, U factor and solar heat gain coefficient for your residential building, uh, then you'll need to have calculated and listed what that area weighted U factor is for comparison to your uh, energy code compliance requirements. Um, mechanical system design criteria. Um, if you're doing a manual J or something like that, you need to list, um, you know, what's the climate zone you're working in, what are your uh, design uh, weather conditions. Um, and then you need to list the mechanical equipment uh, efficiency, system types, um, capacities, um, controls. So you need to have documentation of what the controls are. Um, duct sealing, pipe insulation, and air sealing details for the building envelope. Uh, so we're going to get into a little bit of detail on how that might look. Um, the first thing is, um, a lot of these um, we see in drawings are included in summary tables, uh, either in the drawings themselves or in the construction documents. Uh, what we'd like to recommend for everyone is that uh, you have a single source to reference all of those. Uh, so uh, if you're going to document in your construction drawings, um, your code compliance requirements, you might have a summary table that looks like this, um, but you might reference specific material uh, properties that are in the specification documents. Uh, so that's what you're seeing here is there's a sheet summary that says where to find uh, values and information and then just a specifications document summary um, showing where to find additional information. And this just helps your um, plan reviewer um, to get through and find that information more quickly. It also helps for you to make sure that you don't have conflicting information in your construction drawings. Um, a lot of jurisdictions will include summary information uh, for a building. Uh, you can see an example here from the Peoria Building Office. Um, includes address, um, basic information on building size, surface areas, um, what types of materials are used in the building. Uh, again, just highlighting that while this is included on some code application forms, it's also a good practice to include this summary information in your drawings or in your spec sheets. So again, that it's all in one place and you've got quick and easy reference during plan reviews. Um, um, another example that, that we like to show off is from the Chicago Building Department um, is documentation in your drawings of what your compliance path is. Uh, and this just helps your code official know what kinds of things to look for in your compliance documentation. If you're doing the prescriptive path, they're going to be looking through your plan drawings and your specification documents for those prescriptive requirements of the code. If you're doing a res check or something like that, um, through a, or a com check, uh, which is shown here, um, then they know to be looking for that output report from a com check or res check. Um, and same thing for a building performance method. They're going to be looking for a model uh, along with comparing to your drawings to ensure that your model and your drawings match up. And again, we like to see this uh, in the construction documents as well somewhere. So again, all your information is at a single source. It's easy to cross-reference. Uh, so let's get into what to actually uh, look for in a plan review for the building envelope uh, for residential building. So this is a good summary of uh, the materials for the building envelope. And we've added onto this um, a side table of what are the requirements per the IECC. Um, so again, you've got a really quick reference here. You can see my U factors are less than the code requirements. So I'm in compliance. Um, solar heat gain coefficients, uh, if they're listed, are higher um, or equal to and in, therefore in compliance, or sorry, less. Um, so um, this is kind of a, an example of a summary table we've seen in some construction uh, drawings or specification documents we'd like to see proliferate uh, more. And it's a really quick and easy way to reference am I in compliance? Your code official can look at it and quick review. Um, and so it, it speeds up that review process. Um, if you are using the UA compliance path rather than a prescriptive path, um, the previous table would have been something along the lines of prescriptive path documentation. Um, 
we're showing an example report here from ResCheck um, output uh, showing that they are not in compliance because their uh, maximum UA value um, is higher than their code requirement. Um, but you can do this in plan drawings too um, if you're doing the UA trade-off without using a res check or com check, um, although it's more common that you're going to be using those um, programs to do this kind of calculation. Uh, for air barrier construction and materials um, and sealing, um, the energy code has this handy table to show you um, the general requirements for air sealing and air barrier criteria and insulation criteria. Key things being that the air barrier needs to be continuous. Um, you can't have breaks. The joints have to be sealed in such a way that they're not going to be able to come apart over time. Um, and your air barrier and your insulation need to be in alignment with each other. You need to be in close contact uh, in order to get maximum effectiveness out of them. Uh, so if you have um, your construction drawings, go through and make sure that your details for building joints, discontinuous materials are showing um, these kinds of details where you've got um, sealants labeled, um, ways to maintain the building continuity of layers. Um, and so we've got a couple examples of what that might look like. Uh, so here we've got a building joint between a lower wall and you've got a floor subassembly coming out to the wall on the left side here. And you've got obvious marks that show where the sealants are uh, between those building joints and those uh, layers. So you're showing the continuity of the air barrier here. Uh, and same thing for the partition wall drawing on the right. Uh, you're showing the sealants at the joints. You're showing that air barrier blocking off between that partition wall uh, from the exterior wall, preventing that air transfer potential. Uh, so these are uh, some examples of what good air barrier details would look like for your residential drawings. Another thing that's important to show in your drawings is the alignment of your uh, thermal barrier uh, in the building. Uh, we found this particular example, this is uh, using a program called uh, Therm, I believe, um, showing that um, on the left side, you've got a window that's pushed all the way out to the outside of the wall, and you've got a discontinuity between where that window's thermal break is and where your thermal insulation is in the wall assembly. And it's resulting in that red area arrow is indicating a high area of heat transfer. Um, and what can end up in this situation is in the winter time, you could have condensation issues at this joint and over time, uh, degradation of those materials. Um, what you're seeing on the right side of the screen is if you line those up, you've got much less um, thermal transfer through that joint. Um, so it's important in your drawings to show this kind of detail as well, not necessarily a therm model, but showing um, if you've got window assembly on top of a wall assembly, showing that that thermal barrier is lined up. Um, so just an example of some of the details that should be shown in drawings. Um, this is a, a common joint uh, for above deck roof insulation. Uh, very, uh, there's a lot of different methods to get this detail to show continuity between all the different layers. Um, but what we've highlighted here with kind of the color banding in the middle of the screen is all the four different layers. You've got a water control layer for bulk moisture control. You've got an air barrier, your thermal barrier, and then your vapor barrier. All these have to be lined up and properly aligned and sealed and continuous to get the maximum effectiveness out of your assembly. And what this is showing is what the final result might look like for uh, insulating a, that parapet assembly. Um, and having all those barriers lined up. Um, and it may be a little hard to see, but the sealants and joints details are all called out um, in this drawing. Uh, so this is a very good example of what we would expect to see for that kind of documentation in the plan drawing details. Um, we do get some questions on slab edge thermal details. So we wanted to cover that as well. Um, for a slab on grade, you've got that R10 uh, slab insulation down to two foot below grade. If you've got a heated slab, you also have that R5 insulation underneath and your plan drawing should show those details. Um, what we're also showing here um, are various different means for supported slab edges because uh, we've run across um, what do you do with slab insulation on say the exterior of a building at a doorway or a garage entrance or something like that. Uh, and there are various different means to achieve that same thermal 
continuity across those joints. Uh, so we wanted to show a couple of those examples here. Moving on to our mechanical section plan review, uh, what are some details you want to include there? So again, we want to call out, um, as with that architectural summary where you've got a summary page um, for um, your materials and your compliance for that, you've also got a summary page for your mechanical systems. It's going to detail um, their capacity, their efficiency. Um, what we should also include in there uh, are your manual J design criteria for those systems. And we've got an example of what that summary table looks like at the bottom of the screen here. Um, you're going to include in there um, your location, um, what the design criteria are for uh, different weather conditions. Um, and the main thing the code official is going to be looking for there is does that line up um, with what should be expected per um, ASHRAE design criteria for the region that the building is being built in. And again, this is just a really good way to ensure all that information is documented in one place, uh, either on the plan drawings or in your specification documents. So it's really quick for the code official to find that reference material and confirm whether it's in compliance or not. Uh, system control narratives should also be included in your drawings. For residential, it's usually fairly simple as you've got a, a single thermostat usually. Um, for single family homes. For multifamily, you've usually got that single thermostat per uh, apartment unit. Um, and um, there's a lot more um, push now for these smart thermostats that do automatic programming and, and learning functions. Um, but it's important in those plan drawings to document what the initial conditions for those thermostat settings are, uh, what the initial schedule is um, for that unit to show compliance with the requirements in the energy code. Um, for those uh, controls. Another thing that's very important to include in your construction drawings is uh, details on sealing duct joints. Um, seeing as duct um, sealing and testing is a primary component of the energy code for residential buildings, um, it's very important to get these details correct. Um, a lot of times we see details for um, connecting boots to floor subassemblies, um, but we don't see details for connecting individual items of duct, like your trunk to your branch lines and sealing and insulating those properly. Um, usually most uh, designers rely on the uh, installers to know the proper methods to do those. So those details aren't included in the drawings necessarily. Uh, they're included in the installation materials for the ductwork assemblies. Um, but it would be nice, uh, especially for code official review, to have that in a centralized location, include a couple summary images of how to properly seal ductwork, how to properly join ductwork. And we've included an example here uh, for flex duct, which is fairly common in residential construction, um, on how to uh, properly seal and join different joints together. Um, moving on to uh, plumbing assemblies. Um, again, what we're looking for here is um, documentation um, of specific things that we see uh, as common issues out in the field. Um, one of the things that we see a lot with uh, pipe insulation wrap is uh, a lot of tension placed on that wrap as it's wrapped continuously around the piping. And that causes compression on the uh, inner and outer layers of that uh, angled joint. What you're seeing here is a solution for that, uh, cutting miter joints into that insulation wrap to maintain that full R value. Um, but that's not often included as a detail in the drawings, and so it's very often missed in actual installation. Um, so including these kind of details in a drawing showing, you know, for insulated wrap on piping, you're going to want to include miter joints uh, to ensure that insulation is its full thickness and uh, working properly. Um, those are some details that should be added to your drawings. Um, other things to be aware of is identifying locations for those where that insulation is going to be necessary. Um, for mechanical system piping, you're going to want to be insulating both the suction line and liquid line on your AC units, um, especially inside the building where that hot uh, uh, suction line is going to be 
radiating heat back into the building that you're trying to cool down. Um, lines close to the hot water tank, um, they're going to be that three quarter inch or larger lines. Um, dedicated hot water recirculation systems, if you've got continuous circulation uh, of or recirculation of water in the building, you're going to want to keep that line insulated to keep that heat in those water lines. Um, so you're going to want to call out those locations as well. Uh, and one thing we wanted to highlight, um, we've touched on this in the past, um, but whether you're using a circulation system with a pump or a demand recirculation system with a sensor out in the building, um, both of those have a demand requirement um, for detecting when that hot water needs to flow in the building. Um, and so your drawings need to show where's that demand signal coming from, and you need to have a control sequence that shows how it's going to work. Um, so both of those items need to be included in the plan drawings for your domestic water systems. And finally, on to the electrical plan review. Uh, for residential, it's fairly simple as far as the energy code. You're wanting to document your usage of high efficacy lighting. Uh, what we've highlighted here is lighting that's in compliance and lighting that's uh, not in compliance with the Illinois amendments for high efficacy lighting. Uh, that's 55 lumens per watt for lamps and 65 lumens per watt for, for fixture. Um, as long as 90% or more of the lighting meets that requirement, which does in this case, then you're in compliance with the code. Um, but a nice summary table showing that compliance is important. Um, what we're noting here in this table is that since this is um, calling out the fixtures and not individual lamps, um, that lumens per watt needs to be in compliance with the fixture is 65 lumens per watt. And now looking at uh, using software programs, um, getting into whether you're doing the performance path or a comm check, um, compliance path, um, what should be included for those systems as far as compliance. Um, if you're doing a res check for your building, it's fairly easy to get that compliance because res check has a checklist at the end. As you're filling in the program with your system types, your assemblies, um, it's building a checklist of all the things you need to check that are in your drawings. And that checklist includes a place to note uh, in comments where to find that compliance information. Uh, you can see a couple of notes here on uh, where to find compliance information for our values for your um, assemblies. Um, so for res check, it's a fairly simple process. It's just working through that checklist, filling in that information for that checklist, and filling in where to find that information in your construction drawings uh, or your specification manual. Um, one thing for um, a lot of buildings now that are doing uh, performance um, design uh, using computer modeling, um, we're kind of getting away from these rule of thumbs now. As our buildings have gotten tighter, um, we're adding more insulation. These rule of thumbs don't necessarily apply all the time. Uh, what we're showing here uh, is a sample chart from Energy Vanguard. The rule of thumb for most residential buildings is somewhere around 500 square foot per ton of cooling. Almost none of the buildings that were tested by uh, this group um, were down at that level. Um, a lot of them the air conditioning sizing could be significantly less. Uh, you have much more square foot per ton because of the increased insulation and air sealing values. Um, so as we're doing modeling and things for buildings, we're getting away from these rules of thumb and we're getting more into the design process um, using um, design manuals. Um, for residential, you do have to have a manual J load calculation for your building. And then using that manual J, you're going to do a manual S for your equipment sizing. Um, both those need to be documented. Uh, we touched on earlier for the manual J, you need to document your design conditions. Um, and we showed an example table of that uh, that might be included in the mechanical summary. Um, but you're also going to want to include those calculation reports in your compliance documentation. Um, what we're impacting here um, when you properly size that equipment, you're going to reduce your first construction costs because if you oversize that equipment, um, you're putting in more capital costs to install that HVAC equipment than is necessary. And uh, 
you're going to impact the comfort for the occupants. You're going to reduce short cycling of that system. You have better humidity control, better indoor air quality, better building durability overall, um, higher energy efficiency, and less callbacks to the contractor for customer complaints. Um, so very important to get these sizing calculations uh, correctly done and then correctly documented so your code official can verify them. Uh, so as far as manual J design conditions, what we're looking at here is a summary table for some of the locations in Illinois. Uh, we like to point out here um, that for the design condition for summer, um, if you ever see anything with 100 degrees, um, that's going to be an incorrect design calculation. Um, what we're showing here, um, for most places in Illinois, it's somewhere in the upper 80s to lower 90s for that uh, design dry bulb condition for um, cooling equipment. Um, Similarly, for winter conditions, you don't want to see anything like negative 10 degrees, negative 20 degrees. You're not designing for the worst possible case condition. You're designing for that 99%. You're going to cover most of the, the year. Um, and at those periods where you're outside that design, when it might be a snap freeze or a really hot period, your building thermal envelope and your systems are going to be able to mitigate that somewhat. You're, temperature loss through the envelope is going to be slow enough that uh, hopefully your system will be able to maintain comfortable conditions uh, even when you're slightly outside those design conditions. Um, but very important um, for code officials to be aware uh, when they're looking at design drawings for those uh, manual J uh, design conditions um, of what range those should fall in for Illinois. Uh, so this is an example of that summary, uh, manual J uh, block load calculation. At the top of the screen, you can see the design conditions for uh, the indoor temperature, relative humidity, and you've got the outdoor conditions for winter and summer. Um, again, noting uh, that those are those 99% condition uh, design temperatures. Below that, you're going to have a summary of um, fenestration, you're going to have summary of your uh, building envelope, loads inside the building, um, all the things that affect um, what that heating and cooling load on the equipment is going to be are going to be documented in this summary tape chart. Um, there are also speed sheets to do these um, that are available on the ACA website. Um, and they, they fill out this information in those speed sheets, give you a load calculation. They're not as detailed uh, as a full manual J, uh, so uh, be aware that if you do use those speed sheets, there are some limitations on their use, and you may need to go into a full uh, manual J uh, form or software program for a more complex facility, uh, such as a multifamily building. Um, but we did want to just point out in here the kind of information that's required in that manual J. Um, You've got your floor materials, your walls, ceilings, um, all your envelope loads, and then documenting uh, loads inside the building as far as uh, sensible loads, latent loads, uh, what type of systems are going to be uh, installed. Duct leakage is documented here. Um, so there's a lot of information that goes into these and getting those uh, calculations done. Another thing that needs to be documented um, for residential buildings is the ventilation type. Um, you can have three different options here. You can have uh, negative ventilation, where you've got an exhaust fan in a central location that's running 24-7. Um, as it's exhausting air out, you're drawing in fresh air through leaks, and that's providing that ventilation rate for your building. Um, then you've got a positive um, ventilation strategy, where you have an outside air damper that's connected to the return duct of your HVAC system. Um, as your system runs, it also draws in outside air and pushes that through the house. Um, often there's a timer control on that system so that in mild weather when your furnace doesn't run as much, it's still kicking on enough to bring in adequate ventilation for the building. And then you've got the balanced option where you've got a ERV or two fans that are providing balanced exhaust and return from the building. Um, while this is a slightly more expensive option, it is the best option for overall building quality is you're not relying on leaks in the building to get that ventilation transfer. Um, you, you've got uh, more control over that outside air coming into the building, so you've got better control over that humidity uh, and the temperature of that air. Um, again, going back to duct ceiling details, um, 
a lot of the energy programs don't include these details in them. Um, so these have to be included in the drawings. And you can see here some good notes on joint ceiling uh, for the boot to the floor and the individual duct components. Uh, if this ductwork did fall into an unconditioned space or outdoors, and you would also see notes on here for insulation requirements. And finally, um, as with uh, the prescriptive path, if you're doing a, a performance compliance path using software, you still have to document air sealing details, things like that. Uh, no different from um, your standard drawings, um, but we're showing here some good call outs on the sealant is actually colored, so it's easy to spot where the sealant's at. Um, you've got coloring for the thermal barrier, so you can see it's in alignment. Um, so um, just some best practice details that we'd like to show there. And now I will hand it back to Ryan, and he will go through the residential inspections. Well, thank you, Sean. Uh, before I, I tear down the path of inspections, uh, just want to remind people that there is a question and answer function uh, built in to the platform. So if you hover hover uh, around the top or bottom of your screen, you should see uh, a, a uh, icon that will say Q and A. Uh, so if you do have any questions during the uh, webinar, please go ahead and feel free to type them in there, uh, and we'll we'll go ahead and uh, answer those uh, either as as during the presentation uh, or at the end. Uh, if a, a question, uh, uh, if we're not able to get to your questions today, uh, we will go ahead and follow up uh, after the webinar uh, with a, an answer to that if we don't get, uh, get those questions answered today for you. So uh, as far as inspections go, uh, the code calls out several uh, inspections. Uh, many of these occurred during the process uh, of inspections uh, for other purposes beyond the energy code. Uh, so one of them to start uh, is uh, the footings and foundations. And so what the uh, inspector is going to be looking at is, you know, what is the R value you know, is it in the right location? Is it the proper thickness? Uh, is it far enough down? Uh, and is the insulation properly protected? Uh, so here we can see uh, the, the insulation is exposed for inspection. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, I, I, you're easily able to uh, measure that. Uh, and the protection in this case uh, may not be installed yet. Uh, because the protection may be uh, the earth going to be uh, reinstalled uh, up against that insulation. Uh, but being aware that uh, if there is supposed to be protection called out uh, in, the, in the drawings uh, or uh, you know, insulation that needs to be protected, is there a method in place uh, or, or foreseeable uh, to be installed uh, for there? So. Uh, ResCheck actually does a, a very nice uh, depiction as far as uh, for basement walls, as far as how that depth of insulation is measured. Uh, and uh, we will note that for uh, basement wall insulation, there is also Illinois amendments to this, uh, which does allow you to uh, trade off not uh, installing as deep of insulation if you install more insulation. So looking to uh, trade off some of that performance uh, by allowing you to uh, provide higher performance uh, over a smaller area. So uh, we also do note here that uh, ResCheck does not have the amendments for Illinois built in. Uh, so it is p possible to have a uh, compliant foundation uh, where ResCheck may not give it a passing grade. So. Uh, one of the limitations uh, to be aware of. And so uh, if you are falling into that gray area, make sure you're, you're calling that out. Uh, so when the, the plan reviewer is looking at it, uh, they, uh, they're they aware of what the situation is and, and you're acknowledging that up front. So uh, next inspection that the energy code calls out is uh, for framing and rough in. So here we're looking at uh, our insulation uh, for our framed facility. 
uh, whether that's attic insulation, wall insulation, uh, and it even just calls out all the different uh, properties. One of the biggest uh, issues that we can uh, run into is uh, this fenestration sticker. Uh, on the residential side, we don't see uh, too many where it's it's been missing, uh, but on the commercial side, that can be a very uh, large issue. Um, but making sure that you know these stickers don't disappear before the inspector uh, makes his way through, because uh, this is part of the inspection for uh, framing and rough in, checking the windows uh, and, and the fenestration values, uh, air leakage, U values, uh, solar heat gain coefficients, and the like. So, as far as insulation, the other thing they're going to be looking at is ins. Uh, insulation installation uh, and the details were things uh, properly insulated. Do I have missing insulation where you know I, I didn't quite have enough to fill the cavity uh, and so you know I, I kind of made it stretch to try to fill it uh, rather than uh, filling it in with an additional piece of insulation. Uh, has it been compressed? Uh, did the, the uh, did the trades when they were coming in after the insulation uh, go ahead and just you know cram their their pipes and wires and ducts over the uh, on top of the insulation uh, rather than properly splitting the insulation around it uh, so being being aware of that so checking for those details uh, also during the framing and rough in this is where they're going to be checking for your blower door test uh, this is required for all new construction uh, for the state of Illinois and has been for some time. Uh, and uh, noting here for the state of Illinois, it's four air changes per hour at a pressure of 50 pascals, uh, whereas the uh, International Energy Conservation Code uh, for this climate area would be three. So uh, Illinois does have a, a little bit less restrictive uh, on that. Um, and this testing, uh, the code official may, be, may require it to be conducted by uh, a third party approved by the code official. Uh, there are many uh, different uh, contractors that do provide this service. Uh, if you're uh, having difficult uh, time finding one, uh, one valuable, uh, potentially valuable resource would be to reach out to your local community college and see if they may be able to uh, assist or, or point you in the direction of uh, who may be able to do this uh, because many community colleges have uh, have or have had uh, weatherization training programs in the past uh, so they may have some uh, additional information for you so uh, we'll note that this has to be done after all the penetrations have been made in the thermal envelope uh, because we don't want to test it show it's passed and then turn our house into swiss cheese so uh, for multifamily housing, uh, so this is where uh, we're in this uh, three, potentially four stories or less uh, if you're in the city of Chicago. Uh, low rise multifamily. Uh, Illinois does allow a volumetric uh, or a, a surface area measurement rather than a volumetric measurement. Uh, and so this is really a more accurate test as far as your air sealing details. Uh, because it's based on the square, f the air leakage per square foot of envelope area. Uh, so uh, that's really testing the, the effectiveness of the air sealing uh, in, based on per square foot of envelope area. So uh, do call that out. This is an Illinois amendment. Uh, I believe this is going to be uh, coming uh, for more widespread use uh, across the country here in the next code cycle. So uh, covers our, our uh, roughing, uh, our, our framing area. Uh, uh, we'll note that, yes, the slides will be available uh, after today's presentation, along with the recording of uh, today's presentation. So let me check to see if there's anything else I need to cover here. All right. uh, as far as the plumbing rough in, 
this one, the uh, inspector is going to be checking for what is your controls for uh, hot water. Uh, we note here in the picture on the left, this would not be acceptable uh, because as Sean noted earlier, one of the requirements for uh, plumbing circulation is uh, a demand signal for hot water. Uh, so it cannot be just strictly time-based uh, for a demand signal. There, there has to be either a draw of hot water or some other uh, indication by the occupant, uh, some sort of interaction uh, noting that, that they are going to uh, be needing hot water uh, imminently. So uh, it is something that, that we do need to note is uh, having that, that control sequence in there. Uh, they're also going to be checking for your uh, plumbing insulation and R values uh, and making sure that that insulation is properly protected. Uh, so if it's uh, exposed to, to uh, likely to be exposed to physical damage, uh, is it properly protected to avoid uh, damage into the future, be that uh, crushing or, or being uh, cut or some other uh, damage to it. Uh, they're also going to check for, is it in the proper locations? Uh, this is a common area that's missed, uh, is mechanical piping. Need to make sure that we insulate both sides of this uh, inside the building. Uh, typically, the cold line is uh, insulated because it will sweat otherwise, uh, but the hot line is commonly missed uh, because that, com that hot line uh, will reach temperatures higher than, uh, higher than 105. Uh, during design conditions, this also needs to be insulated. So, and we want to make sure that we're protecting any exposed insulation uh, from any weather where it's located outside the building. Uh, this is a little less common, but if we do have uh, service water heating or uh, HVAC that is serving multiple units, uh, then the energy code uh, refers us over to the commercial provisions rather than the residential provisions. So, As far as mechanical rough-in, uh, this is where the inspector is going to be checking for equipment type, size, efficiency. Do we have controls in place? Are they programmed uh, appropriately? Uh, do I have any, uh, any ductwork R values, uh, duct leakage testing, uh, and the like? Uh, so uh, here noting they're, they're checking not only the controls, but the units and their, their efficiency and the ratings. Uh, this is also something where they may check it against the uh, manual S that was done in accordance with the manual J and say, okay, you specified that you were going to put in an 80,000 BTU furnace. Is the furnace that went in an 80,000 BTU or less? Uh, so did we, did we size it as you uh, said you would? So uh, duct sealing, uh, as Sean noted earlier in the, in the drawings, is very important to uh, have these details as far as where and how to duct seal uh, and verifying that, that this was actually done. Uh, registers and boots, you know, joints in the ductwork, uh, and then also our duct leakage testing would come uh, around this time as well. So again, for HVAC, this will be very similar. Uh, if you do have HVAC serving multiple units, we're referred back to the commercial provisions uh, rather than the residential provisions. So, uh, then we get into final inspection. Uh, this will cover anything uh, that may have been uh, foregone earlier. Uh, did get a, a few comments in as far as uh, the timing of the blower door and uh, duct leakage testing. Uh, some jurisdictions may uh, uh, move some of those around and, and allow you to provide the results towards the end. Uh, the important thing to, to note is when you're doing envelope sealing and duct sealing is if you wait until the very end to do your envelope sealing and you are unable to pass, fixing that can be very difficult. Uh, so you want to test it as soon as you can uh, after uh, the envelope is, uh, is complete and the penetrations are made. Uh, such that if you need to make repairs, uh, they will be as easy to do as possible. Uh, the other thing they're going to look for at final inspection uh, is looking at uh, high-efficacy lighting fixtures. Uh, I will 
uh, as Sean noted earlier, uh, for Illinois, 90% uh, have to be high efficacy lighting fixtures. So on the left here, we see a ceiling fan, which is a single fixture with three light bulbs in it. Uh, and so the 90% the is based on the fixture count, uh, not the bulb count. Uh, so something that's a little bit of a nuance there. So uh, we don't find too many difficulties meeting uh, high efficacy lighting uh, fixtures these days. Technology is, has advanced and costs have come down to where it's fairly prevalent. So. Uh, with that, we'll, we'll take any additional questions uh, that you may have today. Uh, otherwise, if you do come up with other questions that you do have later regarding the Illinois Energy Conservation Code, again, feel free to reach out to us, uh, energycode at cdac.org. Uh, with that, Sean, do we have some questions here we need to talk about? Let's see. Um, you did address the couple of comments on timing. Um, framing and rough inspection uh, was noted that that is uh, for air sealing and they're also looking at whether you're meeting your load bearing requirements for your framing and things like that. Um, and the insulation inspection is a second one that's done after uh, verification of the framing and air sealing. Um, so thank you for that note. Uh, it is good for us to, to have that information. We will update our slides accordingly. Um, we did get a question about, uh, can a residence provide heating for an exterior walk or driveway? Um, that is allowed. Uh, there are code required controls for that uh, type of system. Um, I will look that up briefly. Uh, snow and ice melt systems um, must have uh, automatic controls capable of shutting off the system when the pavement temperature is greater than 50 degrees and it's not precipitating uh, and an automatic or manual control that allows shut off when the outdoor air temperature is greater than 40 degrees. Um, so you can have outdoor heating systems um, but they do need to have those automated controls so that when there's no risk of freezing uh, or slick surfaces um, that heating system is off. There are no further questions. Uh, we don't seem to have any in chat and uh, we don't have any yet coming up in the question and answer. We would like to note that we are working on um, code compliance checklists uh, to try to help uh, smooth this process. Uh, if you are interested in being uh, in testing those checklists with us uh, or want to see what those look like, please shoot us an email at the address on the screen, energycode at cdac.org. Um, as far as uh, when do we have our next webinars and workshops? Let me pull that screen up real quick. The next webinar is in just over two months. Uh, I believe that's May 28th. Uh, and I believe there is a workshop here coming up uh, in next month. Uh, so yes, I would encourage uh, people to join in on those. Um, and I will note uh, these dates are no longer tentative. They are firm dates for the uh, future webinar series. Um, so we have confirmed all of these dates. And the, the next workshop is going to be talking, diving further into key items for plan review uh, for the 2018 IECC residential. And that will be uh, Tuesday, September 15th at one o'clock. So that's uh, being that that's a workshop, that'll be an hour and a half. Uh, so it'll be taking a much deeper dive uh, into uh, that half of today's presentation. Okay. Seeing as we have no further questions coming in, we would like to thank everyone for attending the webinar today. If you do think of a question and need to ask later down the road, uh, please send us an email uh, at cdac, uh, energycodes at cdac.org. And uh, we'll be glad to answer those questions. Thank you very much.